Guys, this is Bruce Tate and Brian Troutwine talking about Joe Armstrong. Yeah, so everybody kind of gets really solemn, and that's the opposite of what we want, right? So um, I want to tell a little bit of a story first. Um, first, I guess I should ask you, where were you when you heard that Joe Armstrong passed? Yeah, you. Uh, we talked a little bit about this, and I, I tried to rack my brain. I don't remember. I was someplace very boring, so it, it, it didn't really stick out. Yeah, it, it, it stuck out for me. And, and the reason was that um, you know, I had a quick conversation. Um, Francesco Cesarini tweeted this out. I think it was um, April 20th. Um, and Maggie and I were kind of in, in the, the den area. Um, we were just watching something. And um, so I had this flurry of a conversation with, um, with Francesco and said, how do you want to handle this? And Francesco said, you know, Joe would want a celebration, so let's talk about stories. And I thought, wow, what a beautiful thing, right? So, um, you know, in a day and age when um, we don't see very much positive out of Twitter, <laughs> this was one of the coolest things that I've ever seen. You know, people from around the world talking about how, um, you know, this this legend kind of, um, kind of touched their life. Um, so I know, uh, Brian, I know you are a failure expert. <laughs> and Joe was in the middle of, of that for you, right? Can you talk yeah. about that? Yeah. It, so when you asked me earlier if I remembered where I was when Joe died, no memory of that. But I, I very strongly remember when I first found Joe's thesis. So I was an undergrad at Portland State University, uh, and I was focusing on um, – does anyone remember the multi-core crisis? Remember when like multiple computer or multiple yeah. processors were a thing? Yeah, so I was focusing on like the brand new area of like concurrent algorithms. Like what would that be like? But also correctness. Like how do you build correct programs? Um, and so I was in the library, in the computer science section of the library there at Portland State, looking for prolog books because I'd, I'd sort of just like come into understanding prolog. Uh, and the librarians had misfiled this like hand bound thesis. And so I sort of pulled that and you know, so I'm an undergrad, I have, I have in mind this notion of like, well, we can make programs correct. If we just think hard enough and if we build enough tooling, we can make programs correct and then all of our problems will go away. And, and Joe's thesis is sort of like, that's the wrong question to be asking of yourself. Like, what if we just considered failure as a first class concern of a system? And then how do you cope with that as a feature of the system? And this was my sort of first foray into this notion that failure wasn't necessarily something that needed to be stomped out, but could, could be reasoned about, uh, could, could be coped with. Um, and yeah, as, I sort of tell people now I'm an expert in failure. I think about systems and how they fail and how they interrelate. And I really would not have gotten into that without Joe. I'd probably be a compiler engineer in Intel, thinking that if we only had enough types, we would have a perfectly correct system eventually. Um, so that, yeah, just pulling that red binding out, that that stands out in my mind. So Dave, were you at the, um, the Code Mesh, um, did, did, did we go to the Code Mesh conference together? Uh, I think it was 2000, uh, I think that you came 2012, right? Okay, okay, so in 2011, um, there, was a, there was a great um, a great moment to be um, like a fly on the wall. You know, I was kind of stalking Joe as, as one of my heroes, you know, and we were, we were at this party, and, um, you know, there's, there's this thing called a Joe trajectory, right? When you walk across a room with him, it was always kind of at an angle, right? Because he'd kind of lean in and, and want to, like, commit to the conversation, but um, but so I had walked up to a conversation between um, between a guy named David Turner, who was the creator of a language called Miranda, which um, probably would have been Haskell if, if they had decided to license it differently, and Joe Armstrong. And um, so this was, you know, one of the fathers of strong typing and um, definitely of lazy computing. And, and he leaned in and said, Joe, I, 
I am floored because I did not expect Erlang, a dynamically typed, um, you know, a lot, lot more loosely typed language than than Haskell to be the one that um, that that you know I didn't expect Erlang to be as as uh, much more reliable than what I've built, but it is. Um, so so yeah, I can definitely relate. Yeah, yeah, it's it's kind of wild how how just dealing with failure in, implies reliability, and you can sort of drive failure into the corners of your program with typing, but failure will still exist. Uh, and there's a whole body of literature around that. Like, um, if anyone's interested, Charles Perrow's Normal Accidents, Living with High-Risk Technologies, uh, is, is sort of about that, where, where systems just have these failures that are intrinsic to them that they always express eventually. Um, and that's really sort of like, if you go through Joe's thesis or you go through the design of the Erlang programming language, it just sort of natively understands that, that things just go sideways. And how do you, how do you live with that? Right. So, um, so that was your encounter with Joe. So my encounter, I would say, was in the area of curiosity, right? Um, mainly, I was scared and I was curious about programming languages for maybe the first time in my life. Um, I had... Um, kind of uh, stepped away from Java with, with Dave's prodding, right? And um, was in Ruby for a little while um, and was starting to recognize that the, that the pressures that my startup were under, uh, were, were, uh, that, that Ruby wasn't going to be enough, right? It, it got us established and started, but we were starting to push into some areas where R Ruby just wasn't the best language anymore. And um, so when, when I started to experience this fear, I started writing a book called Seven Languages in Seven Weeks, right? And um, so, so I sent that to the Pragmatic Bookshelf. Um, and, um, and my editor sent it on to Joe Armstrong <laughs> to, to review Prologue and, and Erlang, right? And um, so I thought I had a pretty good handle on Prologue, um, but I, I didn't know anything about Erlang, right? Here she is sending it right to, you know, the first the first look at Bruce Tate's Erlang code was um, was Joe Armstrong, right? And, and he sent this note back, and it said, I get the sense that this author understands Erlang very well, <laughs> right? Um, and then he also said, but prologue, this chapter needs some work, right? <laughs> and so I didn't know it, but this was Joe's baby, right? And, um, and the other thing that happened was that Joe immediately, I mean, somebody who I had no idea existed, right? I couldn't have told you who the creator was of Erlang was at that time. And um, Joe um, threw himself into the project and, and really started mentoring me and helping me through prologue. Um, and so it's this innate curiosity um, that, that kind of bound us together. So he liked books like Seven Languages in Seven Weeks and was sad that they were going away. So he helped me by introducing me to other people and kind of uh, coming in first. He did an interview within Seven Languages in Seven Weeks and um, helped other people, um, you know, make the same decision to, um, to kind of um, talk to me, you know, just just really a newbie author, um, but his um, his investment in projects like this was was pretty much game changing for me. Um, I, I don't think that seven languages in seven weeks gets off the ground without him. I don't think that this conference gets out off the ground without that book. So yeah, and I, I think that sort of intense curiosity was sort of part and parcel. Like in in this photo, for instance. Fred is having a hard time connecting his laptop to the, the AV system. And Joe's just sort of run up out of the audience and has pushed Fred out of the way. And I'm like, I think I can figure it out. And he's happy. Like, he's happy to do that. Um, and, and that, I think, you know, so for, for me, Joe was, was this sort of like man on a hill, this, this unapproachable man. And then I find him at a conference. And I sort of like make a beeline to him because he's this person I very much respect. And I'm sort of like, I've read your thesis, I've I've read your your blogs, and he's like, yeah, 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 very very good, thank you. And then I sort of I, I give this talk, and then out of the audience I get heckled, and I'm like, I think I recognize that voice, and it's Joe Armstrong heckling my talk, 
and I, I sort of realize um, afterward because he makes a beeline for me. It's a badge of honor, right? It's a badge of honor. And he makes a beeline for me, like I agreed with ninety percent, ten percent, terribly wrong. And what he wants to do is sit and have a conversation. He he was a curious enough man that he would view every presentation as an invitation to a conversation, which is is an exceptional skill to be able to cultivate and. After we, after we became friends, it was sort of this thing where I could bring Joe these insane ideas and we would just sit and talk about them. I think at, at uh, one of the airline factory uh, conferences, I sort of pinned him at one point and I was like, Joe, we can mine the sun. He was like, no, 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 we can't possibly mine the sun. Absolutely we can mine the sun. You just build these giant toroidal magnets and we just sat there for two hours arguing about whether or not you could mine the sun. Um, and it was great fun, like that, that, that desire for, uh, for, for intellectual stimulation, for curiosity, I think is, is something that is worth trying to cultivate um, and is, is great fun to cultivate. Um, and, and being interested in the minutia of things is very Joe. Do you remember his um, his JavaScript program um, to, to do hand-drawn circles because he yeah. couldn't make hand-drawn circles? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, what what a legend to just be like, well, I want to be able to draw hand draw circles, but I can't, so I'll teach a computer to do it. <laughs> yeah, we kind of he threw in like a random thickness and like his his says, Bruce, you know the you know the secret of these hand drawn circles, right? It's you don't make things meet up like this. Look at this, and then he kind of turns it. And he says, that looks hand drawn, doesn't it? And he, you know, so he was really excited about this. Um, so I want to point out that we have an empty chair here, right? And this is for you to um, to tell your brushes with, with Joe Armstrong, either on the internet or with something that you saw. So I'm gonna tell this story, but then I'm going to, we're going to be um, as awkwardly silent as long as it takes to get somebody from the audience, okay? So, um, oh, there's already a hand. Oh, come on, come on. So I'm not going to sit because I'm not going to be too long. Um, I actually wanted to comment on what you guys were saying about the approachability and the enthusiasm of Joe Armstrong. There's one thing that really struck me consistently about Joe Armstrong, and that is he had an undying sense of confidence in what he did which was matched by an unparalleled sense of, oh, I screwed that up. <laughs> um, you, could, you could criticize something Joe Armstrong did, and as long as you actually had halfway decent reason for it, he would enthusiastically take that on. He, I, he's the, probably the most open person I have ever met to criticism and saying, yeah, I got that wrong. Um, Back in 2000, I think it's 2004, 2005, um, he proposed, actually I don't know what the exact order was, but effectively we ended up publishing the programming Erlang book and I wanted to be his editor. So I was editing this book and he would submit chapters and for all his many, many greatnesses, Joe Armstrong was not a great writer. <laughs> um, and. So I would be, you know, making comments and, you know, writing a whole bunch of notes and everything else. And at one point, he came back and says something like, I don't know what you're trying to tell me. So I wrote him back an email, something along the lines of, Joe, this chapter sounds like you're standing on a rock preaching to people, <laughs> right? Get off the damn rock. And I actually wrote it like, because at this point, I was pretty frustrated because every single chapter had been like this. So I wrote this. And he came back and said, oh, okay, I see what you're saying. I met him for the first time probably two or three years later. And we met at a conference, and he introduced me to every single person he met as, he's the person who told me that I write like I'm standing on a rock. <laughs> and he was right, you know. <laughs> and for me, that's just, that's Joe Armstrong. Um, he was... Uh, 
we had this weird situation where we actually gave Erlang training courses. And at that point, all I knew about Erlang was writing his book, or well, sorry, editing his book. Um, and you know, I'd written a little bit, but he, he really knew it. But he actually much preferred me to do the talking, and then he would tell me when I was wrong <laughs> in front <laughs> of the whole audience. And that worked actually really well. It, really, it was like an everyman experience, except for me. I didn't quite enjoy that. Um, and the only other thing I want to say about him is, if you ever see Joe Armstrong or saw Joe Armstrong, walking up to him, you actually had to make a conscious commitment that you were going to go up and talk to Joe Armstrong because there is no way on God's earth you would get away from there in less than an hour. <laughs> you know, no matter what you were talking about, he always had this like dive down a rabbit hole and we're not coming out and it would be totally inclusive and don't you agree, don't you agree and he'd have your hand around your shoulder and lead you off somewhere. So it was always an experience. So, yeah, Ms. Smith. Thank you very much. All right. I remember uh, I was scheduled to speak at a conference. Um, it was a abstractions, the first abstractions in, in uh, Pittsburgh. And uh, it, was, it was on the opposite side of the state from where I'm at. So flying was out of the question, and uh, you know I was all, I was speaking at the conference, and so I couldn't drive because um, yeah I had work to do. Uh, so uh, on the way there I took the bus, and it was the worst bus ride I'd ever had. But I was so excited to get to this conference because I knew Joe Armstrong was going to be there, and I knew at the speaker dinner I could for the first time you know say hi and introduce what we were working on with uh, the work that we were pushing on embedded systems in Erlang and in, and in Elixir. And um, I remember uh, I was I was I had this terrible experience on this bus ride. It was just awful. I was in the I was in a just a unprepared, bad place mentally when I when I saw him. So I'm trying to gather my thoughts, and I'm so I'm like, okay, there he is. There's Joe. Okay, I'm gonna go talk to him. Hey, hey, Joe. Guess what? We're working on this thing. It's really cool. It's like embedded systems development. And it's using Elixir, and it's on it's with Erlang. And isn't that great? And he and he looks at me, and the first thing that he says is, huh. That's cute. We were doing that 20 years ago. <laughs> and, I, and for a second, I'm just like, ah, you're right. <laughs> and once again, yeah, following yeah. that up after, after uh, a talk, it, here, here you have that, met, that feeling, that reaction stuck for a bit. But it was met immediately following my discussion, my talk with the beeline approach of like, mm -hmm. okay, here's where you're wrong. Yeah. <laughs> here's where things went a little awry. And uh, uh, out of that, um, uh, it was it was like, oh, okay. Well, it was we we, we were able to have quality conversations uh, and and really like hash out some of this stuff, talk about what what's wrong, what where the edges are. Yeah, and and after I so you saying that after I got to know Joe more, implicitly what he was doing was inviting you to say, no, 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 it's different, and here's how. Yeah. And then there would be an hour argument about it. Yeah. That was a uh, that was a. Uh, um, the, the, that was the first time. Then the second time, I was like, I, I knew I, I kind of had this like bias going into the conversation, like with Joe a little bit. That kind of stuck with me because it, it was one of the. It's, it is an experience meeting Joe and having that conversation. That's an experience that is unlike any other that I've had with other people. It's you know, and 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 you're left and you're feeling like uh, uh, so many different kind of feelings. Like you're feeling kind of like this joy that you got to be able to have the conversation, and and but you're questioning more and like coming out of it, and it was just. It was it was really interesting, yeah. but so the second time, then I was prepared for this, and uh, this was in uh, I was in, I was invited to come to uh, the uh, Erlang user group um, at, back then. I was in Stockholm, and uh, I remember after the the talk, we we once again met up, and he's like, "Oh yeah, you're doing the in, uh, embedded things," and I was like, "I was like, okay, I've got a topic. Let's talk about let's talk about uh, I/O like a." Um, uh, standard in, standard out connectivity uh, mm -hmm. with the uh, Erlang shell. And I was like, I knew this was a hot topic, and I knew that Joe had seen things on how to fix it, because there was, th I found these comments in the code deep, and I was just like, I was prepared this time. I, you know, you have to do some research sometimes to really oh, get it oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Get it going. Yeah. So uh, I was prepared, and I showed him, and then he's like, okay, this is this is a little deep, but I know to, I know where we, where we can solve this problem. And, and his answer was, um, at the pub on the other side of town. <laughs> 
And so uh, it, it was one of those points where you you uh, presented uh, quality uh, talking points and information, and uh, hours just passed by. Oh yeah, they just fly right by. It's like yeah. the, the party's emptied out, and you're still there. <laughs> yeah, um, you know th what what that made me think of was, you know, as we as we talk about Joe as a as a person, it's also very important to remember he was a very dedicated computer science researcher. You know, he was very very interested in research and very intellectually honest and I think what I would encourage every, everyone here to do is go look up some of his papers they're they're really fascinating pieces of work and they clearly are are born of a of an original mind of someone who's willing to take ideas and sort of go eh, no rubbish like these new things are good and if you don't like if if you don't like at least one of the opinions that you see in those papers you're not trying hard enough right <laughs> So um, I, I love the way that Joe handled um, disagreement. Um, so there was, there, was a, there was one point where Francesco had basically uh, put me in, the, in this awkward situation where he was calling me to Sweden to the Erlang Users Conference to essentially call the baby ugly, right? To say, hey, uh, what have we got wrong with our marketing in the Erlang user community? And... Um, so as, as part of this conference, um, is, as part of, part of my talk, I basically talked about Erlang syntax and how it was not what Java and Ruby and Python developers expected. And um, so I was in the middle of a room, maybe um, two thirds this size, and I was all the way across the room. So maybe it's um, you know, three quarters of the way up and you know, made this comment about syntax. And Joe stands up from across the room, and he says, what do you mean? Erlang has a beautiful syntax, <laughs> right? And so then we had this one of these long Joe Armstrong debates, but for yelling across the room. Any other stories out there? Yeah, come on. Hey, I'm Adam from getdivvy.com. I'm a nobody, but he, he engaged me on Twitter. And uh, he convinced me that, so his idea of like a computer would be a, like a bunch of like maybe millions of dumb processors that all have their own memory and they're all totally separate and they communicate with each other. So his idea of like the perfect hardware was basically how Erlang operates. And at first I thought he was just crazy. I was like, there's no way that could work. Like I thought he, that was a stupid idea. But I, I thought and thought about it and um, actually even today I still think about how like kind of awesome that would be and how that could work. And so I think what, to, what that taught me about Joe was that he just thinks completely out of the box. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So um, can you hear me okay? I can't hear myself. So I met Joe a few years back at uh, Codebeam in San Francisco. And I'd never met him in person. Um, I'd been, of course, in the Ruby community for a long time where, you know, Erlang the movie was quite popular. Um, <laughs> and so I hadn't seen him, you know, older really. And there was a, I was speaking and there was a kind of a speaker's get together at this uh, little cocktail bar in San Francisco called uh, Alchemist, mm -hmm. which is still there and very close to, I work at GitHub these days, it's like right around the corner, which I didn't realize. So I walk by it all the time when I'm there. And um, I walked in, I was a little bit late, and I walk in behind this, you know, tallish guy with a British accent, goes up to the, goes up to the bar, and I'm, I, as I walk up, I notice he's in an argument with the bartender. <laughs> and <coughs> the argument basically consisted of the, uh, the bartender in this very fancy cocktail bar handing a cocktail menu to Joe and Joe handing it back to him forcefully and saying, I would like a beer. <laughs> and, the cock and the bartender arguing with him and saying, you know, sir, this is a cocktail bar. Uh, in the same kind of you know, tone that someone would say, sir, this is a Wendy's. <laughs> and, and he goes, I would like a beer. And the, the bartender eventually gave up, which I've learned is a, is a thing that's suitable to do with Joe from time to time and reached below the bar to a mini fridge and pulled out <laughs> probably the only beer that he had and put it on there. And I don't even think Joe had to pay for it. I think the bartender just wanted him to leave. <laughs> um, and I didn't know who it was still. Um, and I turned around and 
by virtue of the fact of who, who he was with, I figured it out. And I was like, okay, well, that's an interesting way to meet somebody that, you know, you've been, you've been following his career for a while. Uh, another story that I have from that same event, and this one uh, is going to stick with me for a long time. Um, I, don't, I don't really remember whether or not I was, because I had lunch uh, at the same table as him, and it might have been there, it might have been at another, you know, random grouping of people in the hallway. Um, but someone asked Joe, you know, what advice would you give? You have a lot of experience. You've been doing this for your entire career. What kind of advice can you give to somebody to help them avoid the same types of mistakes that you've made? And he refused to answer it and said, I would tell them that they need to make those mistakes. And so that kind of, kind of speaks to his feeling about failure. You know, you have to learn through it as well. So, and that will stick with, you, uh, with me for a long time. Any other? Any, uh, you can just lay it down there if you yeah, want to. Yeah, just, just hang, hang out here for a little bit. <laughs> any other? Anybody else have a story? Well, we've got plenty. Good. She can take my mic. Um, that's what they all say. I know. Sure. Why not? Um, this isn't a terribly long story. I had met Joe a couple times. Um, I think this was at a one of the Codebeam conferences in San Francisco, and. Joe was giving a talk, and I think it was like just on, like he was going to decide once he got up on stage what the thing was that he was going to talk very about. Very typical. Very typical. Um, and the thing that he was, uh, the thing that he was interested in talking about at that time is like things that I don't think anybody in the room had really thought about. He was like, "Well, what is the world going to look like when like programming isn't even a thing anymore? Like, what are the problems that we're going to have to solve? Like, not now, but like." I don't know, 40, 50, 60 years from now, like, right? What, how do we have to start shifting our thinking? Because a lot of this stuff is gonna be obsolete. And I think that it was really interesting because it's reminded me and like spoke to kind of Joe's constant curiosity, not just about computers, but about like the things and the problems that are happening in the world, so. Yeah, so one of the things that we were um, quite worried about when we put this on was would this take on, um, you know, the flavor of, hey, Joe, Joe wore funny socks and, hey, um, you know, he did these um, funny, like, he learned jazz piano and, um, w you know, just a, a Joe trivia night. Um, but you're right. So Joe was very much a deep thinker. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, so... Joe was clearly thinking along those lines, and then, then he was thinking, well, what if we distributed computation? One of the last arguments that I had with Joe, Joe wanted to embed in every new solar panel a computational substrate that would have its own storage and memory and its own mesh network. So he was clearly thinking about these things and shopping them around and getting people to disagree with him so that he could improve them over time. Um, and, and sometimes you would, you would come back, you know, after four or five months when you were going to see Joe again at another conference and you'd, you'd start in on a thing and you'd be like, no, 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 it won't work. I'm not interested in it anymore. I'm on this thing now. And that was just it. That he was on this thing now. And you, you sort of had to catch up. Um, yeah, so I wonder how many people he sort of shopped around that idea. Excuse me, in the years of coronavirus, I'm not taking that. Um, yeah, this is just real quick, but um, I was actually editing another book of Joe's, um, and this was a year ago. He was writing a book with Jeremy Rustin about AR Wiki, which is like where that came from, I have no idea, but he was really enthusiastic about it and he wanted to write about it, so I'm not going to say no. And it was going kind of slowly, and um, I was chatting with Jeremy, and I said, oh, oh, Joe actually had to go to the hospital. Um, and he was in the hospital for a while, and he was in bad condition. He came back out of hospital, and I didn't want to do anything about the book, so I just kind of like lay low. And then Joe contacted me and said, like, why aren't you, why aren't you hounding us about the book? So I said, well, I heard you've been in a hospital, and I, I didn't want to you know, get in the way of your recovery. You know? I said, you know, you need to concentrate on... Your, your, your health, you need to concentrate on you know, taking your medicine and everything else. And he said, Dave, working on this book is my medicine. And he was working on it up to the time he died, which is, uh, well, whatever. 
Yeah, that's powerful. Yeah, so I, I remember being at the conference at, um, you know, at Erlang in Stockholm. And um, there, was a, there was a moment when um, they put together this coding contest, right? Um, that there were um, 25 uh, probably of the you know, better programmers than I will ever be. Um, and they were frantically, you know, they gave them one of these advent of code size problems. And, and um, the idea was to try to knock it out in like 20 minutes or 25 minutes or, or something absurd. And, um, you know, for the first, um, I don't know, six or seven minutes, um, you just, you're watching, you're scanning across, and then you're seeing all these developers. And um, then over time, uh, so all, all of the solutions are up on the screen, right, as people are solving them. And over time, all of the keyboards started getting quiet. And Joe is you know, laughing and pounding on his, and everybody is watching on his solution, just kind of dumbfounded. Um, you know, that was kind of a typical thing. Yeah, I, 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 know, we're, I know we're pretty close to end of time, right? Um, we're okay. We're okay? Does, does, anyone, does anyone sort of recall Joe's favorite program? He'd, he'd talked about it several times. Anyone in the audience remember what it was? The Becoming Server. The Becoming Server, yeah. So for, for those of you that, that don't know what the Becoming Server is, uh, I highly recommend you look it up. But, but what it is, it's a simple server that, that just runs in a loop. And it accepts a message where the first member of the tuple is the atom becoming, and then the second is a function. And the idea for this server is that it can become anything you want it to become. So Joe gets access to this globally distributed network of computers, and he doesn't know what to do with it. So he just sort of distributes this becoming program across the whole thing and then figures that he'll, he'll do something with it later. Um, several years later, he has taken funding, and he needs to justify having taken this funding. So he decides to build a CDN out of his globally distributed becoming server. And then he distributes a, a, a CDN message over the whole thing, and it becomes a CDN. But he, he keeps talking about this, this becoming server over, over the years. And the, the more I sort of engaged with his research, I, I sort of understand why he liked this thing so much. So Joe didn't really have what you would call mechanical sympathy. So mechanical sympathy is the idea that we should program to the computer, that, that we ring, and if you're going to try and write highly performant software, if you have power concerns, you have to have this mechanical sympathy. Joe didn't really care about the computer so much. What Joe was interested in were these programs that could become self-programming in a way, that could interpret these important little programs that were actually of value, which is a, a really sort of amazing programming paradigm. So if you look at how like spacecraft work, they're actually not programmed for purpose. They're actually these like flying interpreters that you sort of beam programs to and then they do a thing. Um, Erlang is sort of designed that way, right? Like message passing, that's what that is. Those little messages are actually little programs that have to be interpreted by these custom built interpreters. And the becoming server is sort of like the distillation of that idea of this like simple little thing that can interpret a little program but become anything you want. And, and like that's, a, that's an amazing feature of his research of just this notion of like how do I take how do I take this simple idea and flip it so that it becomes this massively complicated thing at need, but is in itself still very simple? Yeah, I, I, I can't I can't echo that story um, enough, and it's a it's a good way to wrap up. Um, you know, basically that story represents an academic hack, right? So um, very often, unintentionally, Joe would change the world around him, and um, that was true of people. That was true of the organizations that he touched. I mean, if you look around, that's true. That's true of us. I mean, um, what what we're looking at is, you know, we kind of owe to Joe. Um, so, thanks for sharing this these uh, brief moments with us, and and we'll take a few questions if you like. Or other thoughts, stories. Yeah. Okay, Justice, you want to? Um, yeah. We have one up here. The, the question for those of you that can't hear it is that Joe at one point proposed that if you are going to write scalable systems, you just write a scalable system that scales to 8 billion people and then stop. Um, 
which is sort of very classically Joe, right? You distill the, the, like, what is scalable? How many people are available? Eight billion? Okay, right to eight billion. Um, I, think, I think he did eventually back off of that, in part because his solutions for that were pretty bonkers. Um, <laughs> For instance, he wanted to build, he got very interested in um, uh, ledger systems, not because he was interested in cryptocurrency, but because he wanted to distribute functions in an immutable way that could be addressed by a, a SHA forever and ever. So you would just sort of, any program you could think of, you would put it into this ledger, and then in your 8 billion person scalable system, which would be, then be distributed on solar panels that had computational substrates, uh, <laughs> You would just sort of pick and choose which shahs you, you shipped. Um, I think he got more and more interested in the computer part of that, which is sort of where the, the R wiki came from. R wiki was going to probably be the thing that would go onto these, these solar panels with computational substrate. But I think he sort of backed off the notion of 8 billion scalable and got more interested in like local computation, local computation that then meshed. Another question over here. Did Joe ever play around with the idea of AI in Erlang? So I don't know of anything. Does anybody else know of anything um, in the area? I mean, surely at some point, but I don't know of anything in particular. Brian? I, I don't think he was very interested in statistics. So I don't think any of the sort of modern techniques would really appeal. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, that's a good point. So, uh, so thank you so much for, um, for uh, being a part of this. This is this has been a lot of fun. Justice?